Well, this is a different introduction, but today I want to talk to you about something. Way back before there was the United States, when there were just a handful of settlers on the American continent that had come over from Europe, British settlers, way back in 1774, Captain John Ames did something that would change the destiny of our great continent and create our amazing country. Yeah, he started forging shovels. John's work would continue through his son, Oliver, and the Ames shovel would become something greater in history than we can imagine. You see, Oliver would keep the tradition his daddy had started going and the business would grow, but it would be his sons, Oaks and Oliver, that would take the company and literally transform the American continent. You see, Lincoln won the Civil War not just on munitions, but on shovels. There's images of armies marching to war, carrying shovels. And it was those shovels that brought freedom to the oppressed. It was those shovels that, that changed our world. When the Civil War looked like it was wrapped up and done, Lincoln was frustrated that his project to tie the continent together with the Transcontinental Railroad had stalled. And in two years, less than 12 miles of track was laid across just open prairie. Lincoln turned to no other than shovel men, Oaks and Oliver Ames, to pick up the task. Within less than three years, the entire project would be completed. Why? Because some shovel men went to work and transformed the great wilderness into the country we have today. So that simple name, Ames on a Shovel, is often overlooked. Most people don't even know what it means, but it stands for some men who put together that which would allow our country to be what it is and to change the world with a force for good. Well, today we look into the Word of God in the book of Genesis and we see some shovel men who change destinies and turn things around. Perhaps today your life could be turned around as well. Join me in the Word. Moving in our life from a setback, a loss, to a success. Now, we all know and we all can testify how nice it is when, when somebody shows you a little kindness. Yeah, thank you. You made my day. I mean, when effort is put forth that makes your life better, you know, when you're sitting in a wait restaurant and the waiter comes and fills your glass. Oh, we, we all welcome those moments of life. We appreciate the nice things. We're blessed by those who did them for us. And our life is a, is a collection of blessings. People have done good things that have come our way. You're blessed if somebody brought the sound of the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to your ears so your heart could receive the glorious gift of eternal life. We all appreciate the blessings of life. Isaac, the son of Abraham in the Old Testament, he was blessed and had so many good things from his father. Abraham worked hard, followed God, followed God's principles, and those blessings flowed into the life of his son and Isaac inherited those blessings from God. He inherited those blessings from God that God had given to his father that he then gave to him. I mean, Moses would say to the people of Isaac that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob has met with me. Yeah, that's how significant Isaac was in the blessing. And we all like to testify when things go well and blessings come into our life, but, but what happens when something transpires that undoes the blessing. Kind of like losing your keys, you know. I thought they were there. 
Why can't I find them? It's gone. Where did it go? When, when blessings vanish, when setbacks come into our life, what do we do? Look with me in Genesis 26 and listen as I read these scriptures starting in verse 14. For he, speaking of Isaac, had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great store of servants. And listen to this. The Philistines envied him. The Philistines envied him. Might I note to you, your blessings are noticed by the enemy. The enemy is tuned in and well aware of your blessings. And he's coming after you and yours. The enemy envies you. He knows what you have. I mean, for one, you have the joy of God and he has none. You have an inheritance he has a coming condemnation. Oh, think about what you have that the enemy does not have. You have belonging in the kingdom of God. You're inherited. You're brought in through the cleansing blood of Christ. You've been adopted into the family of God, whereby in the kingdom of God, you'll have eternal inheritance in Christ Jesus. He has been cast out. He will never be back there. That's removed from him, and it's applied to you. You have power in this world. Jesus said he would send us his spirit, and the scripture declares, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The enemy envies your power in the Holy Spirit of God. The enemy works in envy, and envy always moves to go against. And so the enemy envying takes negative action to undo some present blessings. Look what the enemy, the envying Philistines did in Genesis 26. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines stopped them and filled them with earth. They took the life-giving sources those sources where water could come out of the earth, pure, clean, and usable water, and they plugged them back up with dirt. They stuck dirt back in and stopped them. They cut off, they vandalized, they broke the function and caused them not to be there anymore. So where does this leave Isaac? I had a blessing, and now that blessing is gone. I had this life-giving source, now it doesn't exist. And those blessings aren't part of my life anymore. It's been undone by the enemy. But the next step is what changes everything. The next step that Isaac takes in verse 18 is transformative and sets the world ablaze. Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, for the Philistines stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he called them by the name that his father had called them. Isaac said, these blessings that were mine, out of envy, the enemy has undone them. Isaac goes back and digs again. He does the shovel work. Isaac went to work rebuilding that which the enemy had cut off. He dug again what that which had been dug in the days of Abraham. So as Isaac digs again those things that had been dug in the days of Abraham, he's opening up the life sources. Now, we got to remember that good things, right things, spiritual things, holy things, God's ways are intentionally being disrupted. The devil and the devil's people are active undoing the blessings that God's people put together at one time. And so Isaac digs again the wells that his father's servants had dug. Now I can imagine how his father's servants, who had dug those wells the first time by faith with Abraham, the first time those servants were there and they worked with Abraham and Abraham said, I believe 
that if we dig this hole, there'll be water there and that water will bring life and will transform some things. And so those servants in Abraham's time, in Abraham's generation, by faith, they dug the wells and sure enough, Abraham was right and their faith was rewarded and the water was there and the life was there and the flow of that changed things. But now I can just see those same servants, the ones who overlived Abraham into the generation of Isaac. They're older now, they're, they're tired, there's, there's less strength than their body had had once upon a time. And they're bending in and they're digging once more. This time they're not digging by faith because they know what's there. This time they're, they're digging not because there'd never been a well there. This time they're digging because the enemy filled the well back in. This time they're digging and as they, 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 they shovel that dirt out, they know water is coming. This digging isn't for nothing. I'm opening a life source and, and even though I'm tired and I'm weary, I'm pulling this dirt out of the ground and displacing it so that water can be here once again and I know what this can be. I can almost see those servants as the sun is just beating down on them and they're old and they're tired, but they know unless I shovel this out, no life. No life. If I shovel this out, the well of blessing will be open once more. I really believe this inspiration comes down to this when we look at the setbacks of life. That in my encounters with people, just like Isaac did at the wells that Abraham dug and the servants with him, in my encounters with people, People made in the image of God. People that I'm supposed to love into the family of God. People I'm supposed to love to a place of healing. In my encounters with people, do I put dirt in? Or do I carry dirt out? The Philistines in envy put dirt in. As long as we envy people, we're putting dirt in. Oh, envy means that we wish... We had what they had. How many times we envy somebody because they have talents we don't have, or we envy somebody because they're younger than we are. We envy somebody because they're more popular than we are. We envy somebody because they have things we only wish we had. And, and we look at them and in envy, like the Philistines of old, we put dirt in. We put dirt in that hurts them, that cuts off the life source. Isaac... He took the dirt out because he knew the blessing of the water. Am I going to be in my encounters with people a Philistine filled with envy putting dirt in? Or am I going to be an Isaac taking dirt out because I know the blessing of the water? Oh, how I look at others. I either slide in resentment and put a little dirt in there. Or I slide in, in the spirit of Christ and take a little dirt out. I change the world by either loving people to Jesus Christ or I change the world by envying them and like the Philistines of old, packing a little more dirt, hiding the water all the more. I can change the world for God if I love and not envy. That's shovel work. I can change the world for God if I love and don't condemn. You'll remember a moment when they set a trap and they brought a woman and they, they brought her in before the Lord Jesus Christ. And they said, this woman was caught in the very actions of breaking the commandments of God, violating what Moses gave us. This woman is guilty and should be condemned. And they all began to rail and yell and holler and Jesus was there and he acted like he couldn't hear him and he knelt down and was writing on the ground and many have speculated, well, what was Jesus writing when he wrote on the ground? We don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us, but he wrote on the ground. And they kept pressing Jesus for an answer. How do we condemn this woman? What level of the law should we apply against her? How hard should we be? And Jesus said, let the first person who's sinless cast a stone at her. 
knowing that he himself, the Lamb of God, was the only sinless one. The Bible declares how one by one, from the eldest to the youngest, they worked their way out of the room and left, unwilling to say, I'm without sin and cast a stone. Jesus was there and the woman was there. The two of them were all that was left. And Jesus looked at the woman and he said, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has nobody condemned you? Does no man condemn you? She said, No man, Lord, looking at him, knowing he could condemn her. And Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God, said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Go and live a transformed life. Let me tell you something. When we love people and we don't condemn them, we're doing the shovel work of taking the dirt that the enemy has put in their life to block the life source and we're pulling it out. And we're open up that well again so that there can be life and there can be health and there can be freedom because they're brought to the Lord Jesus Christ where they can be transformed. Jesus said in John 4, I'm the well of life. And when I flow into you, there's a wellspring that flows out of you that brings life to others. Oh, my friend, do we love and not condemn we who've had our sins forgiven because there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Do we take our forgiveness of sins and then go about condemning others? Or do we take our forgiveness of sin and go about loving others? Oh, you see, it's important that we love and not envy. That'll change the world. We'll open up wells of life. It's important that we love and not condemn. That will open the doors of life and let the water of life flow. But then just like those older servants who had been there in Abraham's day and were standing there with Isaac, it's important that we love and not give up. Hey, we, we dug that well back in the day with Abraham. We don't care what happens now, no. They looked at Isaac and they said, the same God of Abraham is the same God of Isaac. It's going to be the same God of Jacob. And you know what? Every time the enemy fills that well with dirt, we're going to come back and open it up again. We're going to keep digging even though we're old and tired. We're going to keep digging even though it's been dug before. We're going to keep digging because we know what happens when those life sources are open and going we're going to do this and not give up. Oh, my friend, I think it's so important that we love and not give up. Peter said, how often can we go on this journey of loving with not giving up? What if we took it from two or three times to seven times? Wouldn't that be impressive? Jesus said, no, let's take it 70 times further. Oh, my friend, who is there you've given up on? Who is there that you don't call and invite to church anymore? Who is there that you don't talk to about the sweet gospel of Jesus anymore because you've kind of given up? What is there you've let slide by the wayside? You, you've quit going to the life-giving word of God. You've quit going to your prayer closet about it. You've kind of accepted that you're old and tired and the Philistines have thrown this dirt and it can stay there now. My friend, God would have you be a shovel person. Be somebody who would dig that out once more and open it up and let the life come through. There's somebody who's one invite away from coming with you to church and having their life transformed. There's somebody who's one more witness from you away from turning their heart and calling on the name of Jesus and being saved. There's somebody who's a word of encouragement away from being transformed. There's a little bit more needed and that water of life will be flowing. You see, old Captain Ames couldn't have imagined when he was forging a shovel to help develop the edge of the coast for a wilderness that one day 5,000 shovels a day would fly out. 
that by the 1860s, 60% 60 of all the shovels in the world would bear his name because it was a little shovel work that changed the world. It was a little shovel work that built everything good. And in Isaac's day, it was just a little shovel work that opened up the waters of life once more. Oh, my friend, in my encounters with people, Am I putting dirt in or am I carrying dirt out? Oh, you see, the enemy wants it set back. He wants it to go in the wrong direction. God would have you just dig once more and let the water of life flow in everything you touch. God bless you. closing tag on the end of this video for a simple reason. We're going to be talking about how Isaac brought back what the enemies took away that he had had from his father's inheritance. Yeah, Abraham and Abraham's servants faithfully opened up those wells of life. The enemy came and filled them back up and made them go away. But Isaac and his servants and the leftover servants from Abraham's generation banded together and opened them back up. I believe that we're going to transform the world over the next few weeks as we open up the life sources all around us. We're going to talk about those vital life sources that God's going to enable you to open up so you can move into the victory of Jesus Christ and have that flow, just like they had those wells that opened to take care of their animals. I hope you'll join me on every video of this journey. Live in victory. God bless you.